Rainier Valley Historical Society's mission is to collect, preserve, exhibit, and interpret the history and heritage of Rainier Valley and its people, and to promote public involvement in and appreciation of its history and culture. Our geographic boundaries are from Dearborn Street to the city limits and from I-5 to Lake Washington. Our office is located at 3710 South Ferdinand Street in the Columbia City neighborhood of Seattle. There's the wind up in the pit. Curveball, a line driver to third base, and he knocks it down. He gets to his feet, over to first base, and he's out. Beautiful play. No skin very eyes the catcher. He's in position to pitch. The southpaw is ready. And the record. Ground ball, hopping the short, top right, anyone a short, bounce over to second, he's out, over to first base, and he's uh, out, it's a double play. A ground ball, uh, third base, takes it with the whip of the glove, nice play, over to first base, he's out. A sharp runner off for Kowski's left side, took a jump to his left, came up with the ball, and a short bounce, a hard hit ball, right in the whip of the glove, took a little run to his left, towards second base, and threw him out easily, and that's the second out. In position to pitch to look at first. There's the first ball, and the foul, and they hit the umpire right in the midriff. If you've never been hit by a foul ball, you don't know what you've missed. Two strikes and a ball. There's a line drive in the center field. It's in there for the base. Hit the ball. Rolling, 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 rolling. And there goes Gary way back after the ball. Scoops it up and knocked it. Well, he knocked it down anyway. The runner's in and Moore's on second. Fletcher knows. Looks at Grazzo. Goes into his wind-up. Here comes that ball. Uh, it's a high fly back to the left field wall. Back, 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 back. And it's over. Uh, There is a time in our lives we will always remember. A time we associate with hot summer nights, the slam of the screen door and the soft sound of sprinklers on the front lawn. The half-light of dusk, the crack of the bat, and the voice of Leo Lassen. Leo Lassen was baseball. His delivery was a fast pitch mixed with the dust around home plate. That era, that moment, is over. But let's go back. Back to those years when the Pacific Coast League meant Sundays of activity in the bullpen, double plays, and the voice. Leo Lassen, crackling over our car radios, bringing his imagery, idioms, and excitement. Leo didn't begin in radio. He was never a trained professional. His love for sports found its first expression in print. Royal Brougham of the Seattle Post-Intelligencer recalls Leo's early days as a Puget Sound sports writer. Yeah, he started on the Seattle Star. It was a little afternoon paper, a bright, live little paper. It uh, died uh, quite a few years ago. And then he came over to our paper, and he worked for a while there, and then got into the radio, and, and uh, that... Uh, uh, he did double duty for a while. He would write a story of the game for us after he finished with his announcing. But it wasn't too satisfactory because he was about drained and beaten after a tough game, and his stuff wasn't as good on paper as it was when he was talking. Leo himself agreed, as we hear in this rare interview, taped the final time he faced the microphone. There's more, a lot more emotionalism and of being on top of the play, uh, doing the play by play, because you never cover the detail in, in the written word a report of a ball game as you do on the radio. How did Leo Lassen become an announcer? Well, Leo was publicity agent for the Seattle Indians at a time when a sportscaster was needed. Lenny Anderson, sports writer for the PI, describes the transition. Bill Klepper, who ran the club, was having a great deal of trouble finding an announcer, so he finally said to Leo, why don't you try it? So Lassen went down there and sat down and... As he told it to me, the first game he broadcast was a recreation, and he didn't find it difficult to do, he said, and uh, he just kept right on broadcasting from then on. Leo became famous for his recreations, one of the most difficult and challenging forms of sports broadcasting. Instead of sitting above the action in the stadium watching the plays, Leo would sit on a radio station miles away from the game creating a one-man melodrama complete with sound effects from no more than the barest information coming over a teletype machine. Emmett Watson recalls the vividness of these early broadcasts. I think the genius of his recreation is that Leo had a photographic memory. He had a deep love for baseball. He had an absolute knowledge of baseball. In fact, 
what little baseball I learned, I learned from Leo on the radio, I kid you not. And he, uh, he could take a player, he knew the player by, he could visualize the player, his stance, his style, his, how far he stood from the plate where he played in terms of the infield, and he could take these, this rudimentary information and create a very authentic picture of what actually was happening. Leo himself comments on the secret of his success. The fact that I knew what I was talking about when I got into radio because I'd been a sports editor of the old Seattle Star for about 12 years. In other words, I'd had a considerable experience fighting baseball and every other sport before I ever started on radio. In other words, you have to have a little bit of background. You have to know the game inside, out, and backwards. A complicated play comes up with a, uh, involving a, 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 oh, maybe a complicated rule. You don't have time. Hey, I can't look it up in the book. You've got to know it now. Uh, he was uh, sort of the type of a person that uh, would just bring you right out to the ballpark. If you were sitting back in the patio barbecuing or uh, cooking dinner in the home and you'd drive down the alley, you'd always hear uh, Leo's voice. Edo Vanny. For 15 years, Ito played the games that Leo broadcast. In 1965, he became general manager of the Rainiers and led them to their final pennant victory in 1966. Ito remembers the ballplayers' relationship and reaction to Leo Lassen. We always had uh, Leo's uh, broadcast going on in the, the clubhouse and some ball player go in there and uh, they'd hear him uh, scream out, back, 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 and it's over! Oh, baby, was that one ever hit! And uh, stuff of this nature, and then he'd come in after the ball game, and uh, we'd imitate him, and it was just one happy family. And the sun comes out again. Clouds are dripping. Cross that sun and off again. Very bright sun shining now. Sun's out of nature, squint. The sun is still shining, a lot of blue showing. It's a Grandma Moses sky overhead now. He saw everything. Nori Suter, one of Leo's closest friends. And that's probably why everybody liked him so well, because, you know, like the moon coming over the fence and all of these things were, were things that possibly a normal individual wouldn't, wouldn't even see it, let alone tell about it. And I think this, this was what... What impressed me more than anything was the fact that he could see so much and tell it. Yeah, he made it live. Royal Brome. He could uh, make a high drama out of a uh, foul ball. There's a park ball and a foul, and they hit the umpire right in the midriff. If you've never been hit by a foul ball, you don't know what you've missed. Two strikes and a ball. But uh, he was uh, a genius and original, and it's only too bad that he didn't get a chance at a World Series broadcast. Well, Leo Lassen was a dynamic broadcaster, using simile and metaphor, with a, accompanied with a, an extreme uh, knowledge of the game, a, a fantastic knowledge of baseball. Uh, he was able to put it all together and create uh, an interest for the fan. Lee Desolate. With Keith Jackson, Lee followed Leo as the man behind the mic. Leo uh, would paint a picture, a pop fly, Leo would describe it like I think everybody's heard uh, him describe Mount Rainier, like a great big ice cream cone uh, uh, out in the sky. And things like this, you could just, so you come to the ballpark and look over that right field fence at Six Stadium, and, and there was Mount Rainier, that big ice cream cone. And uh, uh, he had ways of describing things, uh, all kinds of action. Uh, uh, his, I think, was one of the first, uh, he was one of the first, I think, to bring out uh, the Sidewinder. For a sidearm pitcher, uh, he's dealing from the side. Uh, he had a lot of adjectives, and he was very descriptive. I think he made it exciting. It's a ground ball, hopping the short top right at him on a short bounce over the second. He's out over the first base, and he's uh, out. It's a double play. Back, 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 and it's over again. Emmett Watson. And he could do, he could almost anticipate these uh, these home runs, and they became a great uh, thing to to wait for in a baseball game. So years later, I was still just a young man. I went back to the farm country to visit some old friends, and I was in this farmer's house, and he was telling me about how he and his hired hand had driven into Seattle a couple nights before to see a baseball game. And during this baseball game, Freddie Muller hit a home run, and everybody was cheering and jumping to their feet, but he said the farmer said his hired hand was sitting there looking rather glum about the whole thing, and 
They, they looked at him kind of strange. He said, what's the matter? He said, oh, he said, I wish we were home to hear Leo tell about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a high fly back to the left field wall. Back, 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 back. And it's over. I think Leo was co a completely a unique announcer. And he invented things to say. He wasn't somebody who copied anybody else's style. I doubt if Leo ever listened to another broadcaster. If he did, he probably didn't like him very well. Leo was an originator, an innovator, an inventor. And uh, I think that's uh, why people liked him. After they got used to him, they said, hey, wait a minute, this guy has got something going for him. And uh, they, they stayed with him. And, and they heard other announcers, and they said, well, gee, this guy's got a great voice, but... He doesn't stay on top of the game and give me all the inside information that Leo did. Rod Belcher, an experienced and well-known sportscaster in his own right, replaced Leo for two seasons, 1957 and 58. How did Rod feel about replacing Leo? There was a lot of trepidation, you bet. Uh, you were replacing the, the so-called legend, and he was. And uh, it was tough, but you kind of swallowed hard and said, well... He's, he's gone for this season anyway, and somebody's got to do it, and they've offered me the job, and I'm going to take it and do the best I can. And that was it. It was tough. And uh, you knew that you were not going to get along with uh, an awful lot of the listeners. I was afraid to copy Leo, although, there, you know, there were an awful lot of things that I said that were uh, unconscious imitations or... Uh, almost imitations of Leo. You tried hard not to, but you couldn't help it. You had absorbed so much over the years that he was he was in you. And uh, I don't remember how I described a home run. I was uh, a little bit different than, than Leo was, quite a bit different than Leo. I figured I had to be. The games people remembered most were the games with Leo. But what were the games that Leo liked the best? Well, it all depends upon what you're looking for. If you're looking for a real good close competition or you're looking for the a type of athletes that were playing at the time who later went on to the big leagues, I think that was the, probably the criterion. We went back to the 1920s, and if you just take the San Francisco club alone, the number of uh, ballplayers that they sent up to the big leagues who starred there for years, like Frank Rossetti and Joe DiMaggio and his brother Dominic DiMaggio and, and uh, Lefty Gomez, and just a flock of them up, went out of the Coast League, not only from San Francisco, but from everybody else, from every, every other team. And I think that was probably uh, the greatest period of development in the uh, Coast League was back in the 1920s. The uh, Seattle Club in 1939, 40, and 41, when they won three pennants in a row, which is uh, still a Coast League record, there's no other team that's ever won three pennants in, in succession. And I think the thing about that ball club uh, was the fact that it could run and they had the pitching. You had uh, Dick Barrett and you also had Hal Turpin, two of the greatest minor league pitchers of their time. And you had a club that could run like all get out. They were awfully hard to double up. They could take extra bases, they could steal bases. They had a very fine defensive line through the center of the diamond. Leo also had his favorite type of ball game, the kind he most enjoyed to broadcast. Well, I like to see close ball games where every pitch counted. If you get a ball game that run 9-1, to one, whether you're winning or losing it, it wasn't a very interesting ball game to me. I like where every pitch counted, because baseball is largely a mental game. You have to have a certain amount of physical strength to play it well and to pitch well and to hit well and even to throw well. But if you have a club that can think, because you beat yourself nine times out of ten in baseball or any other sport, it isn't what the other fellow does, it's what you make the mistakes they take advantage of. Now he looks back at the plate, dug at the ball in his right hand, shakes the ball, dropped it under his glove again, now looks for the signal. Very high strung fellow. The redhead nods, swings, kicks high and pitches. As a ground ball, sharp to the shortstop, right at him. Up at the ball, side on the first, easily out. Schuster over to Moran, one away. If there was ever any criticism of Leo Lassen, it was on the subject of criticism. Royal Brougham offers this observation. In fact, it was a, a somewhat of a fault because I think announcers should, when something goes wrong or a mistake is made, I, he could do it in a gentle way. Uh, Leo never said a bad word about a ball player, and they loved him for it. But I think it was somewhat of a drawback. Well, he was one of the few broadcasters uh, uh, that would call it actually like he saw it, and he was not afraid to uh, wreak a little uh, havoc once in a while, uh, bring out a little criticism of some of the players, and consequently I think the fan realized that uh, Leo was telling you the truth. 
practically desolate, so out this way. I think this is very important. Uh, you can't be the good guy all the time. Uh, and uh, if there are... If, if the ball game is going badly, if there are a lot of errors being committed and the team looks sloppy, the possibility that they traveled uh, all night. Uh, Leo would bring this out. He'd say, well, they're not playing very well tonight, a little sloppy, but you have to remember they were on a bus all night coming into Seattle or something like that. I mean, he would explain there's probably a reason for it. Perhaps Ido Vanni reaches the heart of the issue. He called the ball game uh, like it was and, uh, and like he's seen it, and uh, he never uh, hurt anybody. Uh, and he always was uh, for the ball player, and uh, you'd have your bad night, but when you're winning championship after championship, why, if you had a bad night, then your mistakes are forgotten. So actually, he didn't have too much to be critical of the ball teams back there in those days. Leo was never shy about giving praise, be it to an outstanding player or a strong ball club. Well, I think perhaps the strongest ball club that I ever saw the, as, well, for a one-year operation was the Los Angeles team of 19, uh, 1934. That's when they had that great outfield of Frank Demery was in right field, and they had uh, Arnold Stats in center field, Marmon Goodhart in left field, and they all hit over 300. And then you had big Jim Oglesby was playing first base. I've forgotten who the second base, and I don't know if Jimmy Reese was there that year or not. Uh, Carl Detmar played shortstop, and Gene Litter played third base, and Gilly Campbell was the catcher. And they also had some great pitching that year. That was the year that Faye Thomas won 15 games in a row, and Seattle beat him in, uh, in a wild ball game in Seattle when he tried for the tie the Coast League record of 16 straight. Nobody ever did reach 16 straight except Frank Browning with San Francisco back in 1909. Jim Wilson of Seattle, you know, he won 15 in a row, but he couldn't win the 16th. They got beaten in Hollywood, four to three. While Leo had an amazing memory for facts and figures, he never felt that statistics took the place of action, color, and excitement. We didn't use quite so many statistics and, as they do today. They get so uh, wound up over statistics that sometimes they forget to tell you what the score of the ball game is. I think that's the most important statistic. Leo had similar feelings about television sports. They're going in a little bit more for letting the picture tell more of the story. But they don't get quite as emotional up over the games as some of us old timers used to do. I figure this way that if the fans out there are getting emotional, why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't you get excited if they're getting excited? You're human too, you know. They like a little zingle with it once in a while. You can't yell all the time. You have to use a little, little judgment. But if a thing is a situation is tense, you get tense. There's a line drive in the center field. It's in there for the base. Hit the ball. Rolling, 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 rolling. And there goes Gary way back after the ball. Scoops it up and knocks it. Well, he knocked it down anyway. The runner's in and Moore's on second. For all of his popularity, Leo was a fairly private person. Longtime friend Nori Suter makes this observation. He wanted to stay in the background. He didn't want to be the central figure when he stepped out of a car or something to be deluged by people. He was somewhat of a loner from that standpoint. But he did do a lot of, of public appearances, speaking to Rotary and organizations such as that. Royal Brougham knew Leo personally and professionally. It was Royal himself who composed this poetic eulogy. A familiar voice. I heard a fading echo of a voice I've heard before. The game's in extra innings on some unfamiliar shore. I thought it just a fantasy, a mood that wouldn't last, like other fancied voices I've imagined in the past. And then I heard the words again which brushed aside all doubt. The ball game's never over till they make the final out remembered phrase of other days. And now I understand. It's Leo at the mic again in some far distant land. He took us out to the ball game. He captured the essence of the action with accuracy and color. Legends and memories have a way of becoming larger than life. And so it is with Leo Lassen. We've tried to give you an insight into Leo, but the true testimony to his magic is that he still affects us the same way today. And now, if you turn this record over, we'll go back, back, back one more time. Now the position to pitch, the look at Sagan. Van Dyke delivers. It's a ground ball back at the pitcher. He knocked it down. He picked it up on the uh, dirt pitching hill, throws him out. 
Lane hit a high bouncer back at the pitcher, and the pitcher got his glove on the ball up over his head, uh, hit the web of his glove, fell at his feet for a moment. He didn't know where the ball was. It was lying in front of him. He finally located it and threw him out. That's the third out. The last half of the seventh is over. And it's two runs, and it's one, two, three hits, and no errors. We're going into the first half now of the eighth inning, and the score is Seattle 13 and Los Angeles 3. Seattle won the first game 4-3. to three. Well, there goes Charlie Shands out of the Sun of the Diamond. This is the ninth inning finale. And still more Puget Sound dealers are joining the Hanson Bread Parade. Here are two more new dealers in Seattle where you'll find Hanson's Broader Baked Bread available every day. Matthew's Grocery at 4820 Rainier Avenue and the Victory Grocery at 7900 Rainier Avenue. With Hanson's Broader Baked Bread now made with milk fresh flour, you'll find this famous bread baked right here in Seattle at the Seattle-owned and operated Hanson Baking Company plant better than ever. You just ask for the baseball bread at your grocery store. That's Hanson's Broader Baked Bread. First half of the eighth inning is coming up, and here we are, ready to go again. Shans, last practice pitch, the throw down a second. Nostrowski is ready to go into the batter's box. And we have just time to tell you that this is Radio King, Seattle, K-I-N-G. Okay, Leo. Here's Ostrowski with an infield single and three trips. He struck out on each side of it. Shans up on that hill. He's got up six hits, and the three runs off him all unearned. Fastball, strike one call. He struck out eight. Big Charlie swings into his windup, delivers. Slider outside low, and it's ball one, one and one. Shands again gets his signal. Here comes that ball. Swing and a miss. It's a low fastball on a strike two. Two strikes and a ball. Curve ball, a high foul over the rest of the right. It was a breaking pitch, and he fouled it off. It might have been the slider. It's two strikes and a ball. You can see the break on it clear up here. Shans beats the ball into that black glove. Now he looks again for the signal. In that freewheeling windup, coming in overhanded. That's a pop foul over the rip to the right. Two strikes and a ball. He's thrown a lot of pitch balls tonight with all those strikeouts. He's rubbing up that ball. Now he looks back again at his catcher, Sammy White. At last, he dips down to his thighs, swings back over that blue cap, and he pitches. Curveball low, and it's ball two, two and two. Even with a big lead of 13 to three, he isn't e easing up on any pitch. He just keeps pouring that ball in there. Puts a great deal of physical exertion into his pitching. He looks again for the signal. Nods his head, now he's winding up. A line driver with a third baseman foul. Sounds as if Johnny broke his bat. He's going back where the bats are racked. He hope he got a new bat. He hit that ball fairly well over the third baseman's head. And a lip foul back in the bullpen. Two and two. Here comes that ball. Fastball inside high. Ball three. Three and two. A ground ball hopping to the third baseman. He got up with a clean. He over to first base. He's out at first. Lane over to Coleman. One away. Everson is up. He has a walk on three trips. Dan Snow going into his windup. Delivers. Fastball over the plate. Strike one called. This fellow hasn't hit one in this series yet, but if he ever goes for real distance, Ramsey caught one off him near the wall in center field the other night. Last night. Uh, ground ball top of the third baseman, and he's out of there. Lane over to Coleman. He may unload one before this series is over. He had a couple of last year when he was up here with the Angels at Averson. Two out now. D'Amato is up. D'Amato's failed to hit him three trips. He got a life and a double boot by Albright in the second inning. Later scored. He skied out twice since then. Curveball outside, ball one. At last, that wind up. Here comes the ball. Fastball over the plates. Strike one called. It's one and one. Thirteen to three, Seattle. Here's that pitch. Fastball a little bit low over the plate, but too low. It's ball two. Two balls and a strike. And he pitches. Curveball outside high. Breaking ball. May have been the slider. Ball three. Three and one. Three and one is the count. Two men are out now. 
Fastball over the plate, and it's strike two called. Sammy White threw the ball to the third base, and they've lost the count, three and two. Here comes that windup. Swing and a miss, he struck him out. Tomato struck out swinging, it was the slider. Strike on number nine for Shans. No runs and no hits and no errors. We're going into the last half of the eighth, sending in the score. Here's Seattle 13 and Los Angeles 3. We're in the first half of the ninth inning, and Seattle's ahead 13 to 3. It's a fly ball going into right field. Sheridan waits for the ball to drop. And he catches it virtually in his tracks. One away. Gary at his up. Cecil Gary at the little center field of a leadoff man, a left handed batter. He struck out twice, skied out, and in between he singled that of the second inning to drive in a run. There comes that wind up the pitch. Fastball, strike one called. Fastball outside, and it's ball one. Swing and a miss. He took a terrific cut, and it's two strikes. It was a slider inside. Two strikes and a ball. Ball on the back of the box again. It's a line fly going into right field, quite high. Higher than I thought it was going to be, and Sheridan catches it again right in his tracks, two out. When I first left the plate, I thought it was going to be a harder hit ball now, but just a big, lazy fly to right. Glossop is up. Glossop is a walk in four trips. He struck out twice and grounded out once. Two out now. Shans is within one foot out of winning his ball game. A half-hearted swing and a fastball, and a strike one as the catcher dropped the ball. It was a fastball. If he started his swing and couldn't stop it. Foul to the rip to the left. Strike two. Now he's within one strike of winning. Chance takes off his glasses, turns his back to the back of the plate, wiping the glasses off with a handkerchief. Puts the cap on his head more firmly now. Stuffs the handkerchief back into his hip pocket, takes the ball out of that glove, looks for his single. A uh, single now. And now he's in motion. It's a high pop fly going to Albright. Jackie is under at the edge of the grass. Two steps back, and he catches it. There's your ball game. There's your doubleheader. There's your seven straight. And the little first half of the ninth inning is one, two, three. No runs and no hits and no errors. They're all shaking hands with Charlie Shands as the Rainiers troop off that uh, diamond. No runs, no hits, and no errors. And the doubleheader is over, and Seattle wins both games of the twin bill. Four to three, and uh, by the score of 13 to three. The short score in the first ball game uh, for uh, Los Angeles, three runs, seven hits and no errors. For Seattle, four runs and six hits and no errors. In the second ball game, the Angles jumped uh, into the lead with two runs in the first inning after two strikeouts. Moran singled to right, Mattern got a life and a boot by Albright, and then Malone doubled off the right center field wall for the two tallies. In the last half of the fourth inning, in a comedy of errors in which the Angles contributed three boots, while Seattle was driving out four hits, including a double by Lyons and the only extra base blow, and Shans himself uh, singling home two runs. Uh, the uh, Rainier scored six times in the last half of the first, drove Anthony to cover, and then Van Dyke went the rest of the way, and the boy in spots was hit pretty hard. Shans leading the attack uh, along with Lyons. Shans getting a two doubles and a single and five times up and driving in three runs and scoring one. Lyons hit two doubles and a three-run homer and was hit by a pitch ball in five times up. The short score in the second ball game for Los Angeles was three runs and six hits and four errors, and for Seattle was 13 runs and 14 hits and three errors. And the battery for Los Angeles was Anthony Van Dyke and uh, Malone, and the battery for Seattle was Shands and Sammy White. Here comes that ball. Fastball outside, caught the corner, strike one called. It's one and one. There goes that wind up the high kick on the pitch. Curveball over the plate and a strike two called. Lynn's been in constant hot water until through that seventh inning when he retired the uh, Rainiers one, two, three with two strikeouts and getting Neal on the ground ball. But only one run off him, that in the third inning. 
From the second through the sixth, Lynn gave up ten hits and five walks and only one run. There's that windup. Change of pace outside. Ball two. The ball got away from the catcher, went to the backstop. Two and two. Well, what he's throwing out there by that changeup? Maybe a knuckleball. Now he looks back at the plate. Look at the ball in his right hand. Shakes the ball. Drops it under his glove again. Now looks for the signal. Very high strung fellow. The redhead nods. Swings. Kicks high and pitches. Change up. Foul back into the screen. Looks like a knuckleball. Two and two. Jimmy again looks for his signal. Here comes that wind up. And he pitches. It's a bonding foul. Ball rolled weakly over to the right. Foul ball. He came up with that change up again. Two and two. Now Hillis taps the plate lightly. First man up for Seattle in the last of the eighth. The pitch. Again, the same delivery. And it's ball three. It looks like he's experimenting a lot with that knuckleball. That looks, that's what it looks like. That's what he's throwing. It's the first time I've ever seen Jimmy throw it. All right, he's looking again for the signal. Here comes that ball. Three and two. That's a ground ball. Sharp to the shortstop. Right at him. Up with the ball. Side iron to first. Easily out. Schuster over to Moran. One away. All right, is up. He's been aboard three straight times on two walks and a single. Jackie gets a nice hand as he walks up towards that plate. Now Lynn beats the ball under that black glove. He looks now for the signal. The outfielder run to the left on Jackie away. There's the windup. Fastball, strike one called. Strike two, it's a fastball called. Lynn again gets his signal. Into the, into the dirt with a knuckleball and then bounce back at the backstop. That's what I'm going to call it because that's what it looks like from here. Two strikes and a ball. Jackie digs in over the plate. Lynn again goes into that freewheeling windup. Kicks very high and pitches. That's the knuckler inside. That was a knuckleball and it's ball too. You can see it wobble. Two and two. Two and two on the hitter. One man is out. Brazo in the next batter's circle. Here comes that windup. Swing and a miss. He blew the fastball past him. Albright stopped. He struck out swinging. Strikeout number seven for Lynn. Out at first base. Schuster to Moran. Seattle for the second straight time. It's one, two, three. No runs, no hits, no errors. Here we go into the first half of the ninth inning. And the score is still two to one Seattle. It's really down to cases. Well, we still don't have those attendance figures. They're still working on the arithmetic done in the uh, stadium office, and we probably won't have it in time uh, for the broadcast if the game is over in nine innings. All right, there goes that windup. This game isn't over yet. Fastball over the plate, strike one called. This matter is rough with that wood. Three tough hitters, matter Malone and Ostrowski. Fletcher now looks at Grazzo, goes into his windup. Here comes that ball. Uh, it's a high fly back to the left field wall. Back, 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 back. And it's over. <laughs> Mattern hit the next pitch over the king sign for a line home run that was well hit. 345 feet over the wall. Tying the score at 2-2. Two to two. Home run number four for Mattern. For the season, run batted in number 22. He stole home as clean as a whistle. He was over that plate before Grazzo could get that ball on him. Fletcher just let him get too much of a jump. He didn't even look at the runner. He just kept on that long swing windup. And D'Amato stole home as clean as a whistle. The first half of the ninth inning is over. And it's uh, a two runs. And it's three hits. And it's no errors. We're going into the last half of the ninth inning. We'll have a pinch hitter for Fletcher, then up to the top of the order for Ramsey, and for Moore. Last half of the ninth inning, and Seattle's really up against it now. It's the first time that tonight Seattle's been behind. The Rainers scored one in the first, one in the third, and the Los Angeles picked up one in the fourth. 
And then uh, Fletcher, uh, after Lynn, the rival pitcher, at single infield in the fifth inning of the first man up. He retired 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. He retired 12 men in a row. And the 13th man in that spring, Mattern hit a home run. Then Malone, single to left field. Ostrowski uh, with the infield looking for the bunt. Bloop one back up at the shortstop for another single. Tomato had run for Malone. Moran sacrificed. Glossop was purposely passed. Then Furbrink, the pinch hitter, struck out. And Fletcher had a chance to get out of the jam. But then taking a long swaying windup and uh, evidently forgetting about that runner at third. Uh, Fletcher uh, got that ball to the plate too late as Amato stole home as clean as a whistle. And uh, then he got uh, Gary on that top flight of Albright who made a spectacular catch. And now we're in the last half of the ninth inning. It's two to one, in uh, three to two rather, in favor of Los Angeles. Two out in the last of the ninth, and Rainers one run down. Carlson pitches. Fastball inside, caught the corner, strike one call. Swing and a miss, the big curve inside, strike two. The angle to now within one strike of winning the ball game. Two men are out. Now Carlson to get up on that rubber. Two men gone. Leon has a single and four trips. He scored one run. It isn't over yet. The pitch. Curveball low and it's ball one. Burbank throws the ball back of the hill. Two strikes and a ball. There goes that wind up. It's a ground ball. Hopping to the second base and a big bounce. He has it. Over to first. There's your ball game. There's your winning streak. The last half of the ninth inning is over. No runs and no hits and no errors. And the Angels with a spectacular ninth inning finish take the ball game with a score of 3-2 to two to break Fletcher's winning streak at 12 in a row and uh, also to break the Seattle Rainier winning, winning streak as a team of eight games in succession. So I return to the yard again tomorrow night at uh, 8.15 with the mailbag program. The play-by-play -play account for those of you who can't attend here at the stadium in Seattle in person at half past eight. Uh, tonight's baseball out of Seattle was brought to you with the compliments of, uh, of the Hanson Baking Company, a Seattle-owned and operated institution. Bakers that famous Hanson's brought a big bread. Both Hanson's and my friends hope you enjoyed it. This is Leo Lassen speaking. Good night.